Here we are on beautiful Jones Street. You saw Ted Jones. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to like do a podcast in LA. Not really. I don't want to talk ish about LA comics or people in LA, but the traffic. And then for you can't really make an excuse for traffic or whatever here in New York City. You just be like, oh, the train's running late. But Dan's a good kid. We'll see what his excuse is when he gets here. All right, cut to Dan sitting right here. Or is it Daniel? I don't know, bro. I never know what to call this kid. Are we we're going? Yeah, we're going. No, I don't mean like that. Why do you hold? Okay, are you recording? Do you want me to do the stick too? I just feel like I, I feel like I want you to be more comfortable. I know how to. Okay, I've I've done a, a few podcasts. Yeah, but life. do you like I've to done, hold it or do you like to have? I'm chilling. The stick? However, you want me to do this, I guess I think it, well, it's up to you. What? I'm good. You're good. Yeah. Good to see you, buddy. Okay. Thanks for coming on the pod, <laughs> dude. So you were my one of my first. I'd say acquaintances in the comedy game. And Dude, we've we talked a, about this before. We story, but let me ask you, why do you hold yeah. the thing like this? You like to be loose and free? Well, I want you to be loose and free but too, like with your hands. Okay. Oh yeah. You want me to be, yeah, yeah. I want you to be animated. Cause also you're an animated guy. Gonna, that's what's going to, that's what's going to do it for this episode. I, well, right? I think that's what I want you to be more comfortable with. I'm comfortable. I'm, com <laughs> I'm as comfortable as I could be for the fact that I, Ran in here like an idiot. Why'd you run in here like an idiot? You know, I was late. I thought you were on the east side. It's I okay. Just oh, you because did? Because you're Jewish that you'd be. I would <laughs> honestly. I just didn't think you'd live. To be honest, around I, Penn Station. That's a dude. Don't give him my location. Man. Oh no, the stalkers. But the thing, the thing is, I uh, that's a, a pretty decent assumption that Thank I would you. live in the in like the East Village. I east went side, to Lower the gym side. and then assumed that I could get on the four, five, six train and get to yeah. your apartment because I just in my head I knew where you lived, but I was wrong. Um, you took an ice bath. A little ice, yeah. I got in the ice. I knew it. I knew that. The, I, I knew that this would. Uh, I knew I needed to be on my game. And you'd be for ready for the Jones ice. World yeah, you'd be podcast. ready for the ice bath questions. Do you take cold showers, or are you just like the ice bath? Um, the ice bath's easier, I find, because it's like uh, you can just force yourself to do that one quick thing right in there. But dude, what are we, Joe Rogan? Come on, let's, yeah, bro. Let's talk about. Let's started? talk about the real shit. All right, let's talk about the real <laughs> shit. Yeah, so I went to a school called the I International Culinary Center in uh, in Soho. It uh, and you know my my dad died ten years ago. And, Sorry to hear uh, about that, bro. Oh, you, where were you when it happened? Um, and actually, I've tried a lot of lines like that about when people say offer their condol. I appreciate the condolences, but um, I you know it doesn't help me right now. Um, but then I didn't know what I was doing because I, I was interning at the Howard Stern show and I came back to Toronto because he was sick. And I kind of was in no man's land and I always want to go to culinary school. And that's when I went to culinary school. But then through culinary school, I started I started writing about food stuff. And then through that, I ended up at Eater, which is the food company that I worked at for a long time. But yeah, I can I can fucking cook. Oof, you know. A lot of people say that my food is like on the level of Yukon like, men's tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom of the five star barrel. Bottom of the five star. Mm -hmm. um, becoming a. I gave you a lot there. So if you don't have any fucking questions. No, no, no. Now, bro. Come on, bro. I'm just saying. Go on. Becoming a chef, though, and being in culinary school is very demanding, correct? Well, look, if, uh, you know, a lot of people are throwing out. I, I don't, I've never seen the bear, but. Um, Ugh, I hate that. A lot of people are throwing out the, these food culinary terms these days. I'm sure the bear corrects this because whether or not it's annoying, I don't know. But I'm sure they try to get stuff like this right. But um, you don't become a chef. Like a chef, a chef is someone who lead. The second you're calling out orders in a kitchen and people are saying, yes, chef, that's when you become a chef. So you can cook for 20 years and on be on a, be, just be on the line and never be a, a chef. But um, were you going to ask if it was demanding? Yeah. Yeah, but culinary school is kind of a joke. I made it more demanding by working nights at a restaurant that I liked. But culinary school is filled with, of my 20-person culinary school class, only one to, only three to four of them are still doing anything culinary. Like, unfortunately, it's another one of those things that's become a lot of bloggers and and influencer types who like, hi, you know, I make lists of the best restaurants in Soho. And so like, it's always been a dream of mine to go to culinary school. And the second it becomes hard at all, they, they quit. 
uh, but that the, every old French chef laments on the loss of any real talent and skill and drive in the culinary field. It's not, it's not what you need me to go on about, although I'm happy to. Um, and then, so I was doing that during the day and then working at a restaurant called Tomi in the East Village at night. And man, did I get burnt out. But I, I put it on myself. But I got, yeah, at that point, I got real burnt out. Like, I wouldn't say that I know what it's like to grind my life away in the kitchen because I didn't do it for that long. But I know what it's like to feel burnt out in the way that they do and see why there's so many chefs who get so hopped up on why, why would you? Why did you say that you got burnt out, though? Like, what specifically in the kitchen? Because from a person who maybe would eat at a restaurant here and there. Why, why well, it's just the, the hours in the world of of the kitchen are, are just frankly different. I mean, there are bankers and, and traders and stuff who are working those crazy hours and people in hospitals work those crazy. Hours. I mean, I imagine like it is from a physical, uh, maybe not, um, well, emotionally too, because you're getting yelled at. And if you fuck up, you're getting destroyed. I imagine it's kind of similar to being, um, the doctor or the nurse or like a, a, a who is on the floor for longer than you should be because you're doing overtime because in the, in the kitchen, there's this camaraderie where you're all kind of fighting against the diner in a weird way. So there's just, they can ask more of you. They can, they can, and you want to do a good job. You want to please the chefs. So you're, you know, depending on the style of restaurant, you show up at one or you show up maybe at one if it's a dinner, just a dinner place. I mean, if a lunch place, brunch place, fucking get about it. Show up at one or two in a great place, usually around 11. And then you work till 11 and then you clean up. And then depending on the, depending on how fancy it is, you're cleaning your own station uh, to varying levels. Sometimes they bring in people in the middle of the night who are going to tidy. Um, but you're doing at least 13 hours on your feet. Uh, everyone's smoking cigarettes. Everyone's doing Adderall and stuff. And you're always racing. You're always racing to do as much as you can. Um, and then there's some breaks. And then in service, it's a whole other thing. I mean, if you're talking to a small New York restaurant where they're bang, bang, services, people breathing down your neck, where the fuck's that? Where the fuck is that? And it's fun because you flow, but you have a bad service, it's like, you're just getting destroyed, they'll send you home, you know, it's, you really get, and, and they don't, it doesn't matter that, like, I was young, right, like, that's how you get good, is by getting beat up in an environment where there's a million other people who are, they don't care who you are, they don't care anything about, like, how fast is your food coming out, and with what level of perfection, and you will be yelled at or not yelled at, according to those standards. Would you say that opening up a restaurant in New York City is the hardest business to do? No. I mean, the hardest business, no. I think, I think that you, there's, there's many different kinds of opening a restaurant, right? Like there's kids who come along with money and they want to be involved in something and they open a wine bar in Fort Greene. And that's not, I mean, you know, it probably won't work, but they're not there. They're not really there 80 hours a week. Um, it's the most, I think it's one of the most, I think it's, not one of the most traumatic, but nothing breaks my heart like someone who's good and just doesn't, it doesn't really click. Like when, when I walk by a, uh, a restaurant and it's empty on a Friday night and you kind of see the chef just sitting at one of the tables, nothing makes me <laughs> more sad than that, really. Uh, and, you know, I, it's pathetic maybe that that's what really makes me sad, but that really makes me sad. There, there's a lot of other businesses that are very hard. I think people who start their own anything, people who start their own podcast i mean you fucking have to get your ass out of bed and go film bullshit with people in the park and like if it doesn't work you kind of have to wake up the next day and, and do it again it's kind of like cooking but it's it's not an easy life um it's not an easy life if you want to do it well if you want to do something easy like sell wine and fort green no shots to people who sell wine at fort green but like you know it's the biggest thing with a restaurant in my opinion. Is this actually interesting to you? Yeah. The biggest thing with a restaurant is uh, is someone who is there needs to be willing to die for the restaurant. And that's why 
that's the difference. And that's why when you get rich kids opening restaurants, they don't really care. There's no one there who's willing. To, the best restaurants are opened by people who have their own money in them, who don't have a shit ton of money, or their reputation means more than anything. Or, and they have part, like they're someone who owns 30% is also there. They're the GM. And they don't think about the hours they're working. They think, if I am not here watching every single thing that happens, this place will go down. And if it goes down, they will get there at 4 a.m. and they're not there for a paycheck. The restaurants, you know, chain restaurants and stuff work when they're there. people are there for a paycheck. But real good, good art restaurants, you need to... You get it's like a whole different kind of crazy person. Is this specific to New York City because the stakes are so much higher, or no? Mm, no, the stakes are only higher because there's more competition. But like, if you opened a good, the thing is, like, for a restaurant to be good, good, there's things where you could do like if you open a muffin place that just does muffins and you really are a good muffin maker or you've, whatever but you're doing different dishes and really kind of updating the menu trying to be new trying to be um because the difference between something coming out 10 out of 10 and 7 out of 10 is so minor right it's it's just what's so much what would be something minor? i mean seasoning cook temps like uh different elements of the dish having um i don't know being like over sauced under sauced like whatever raw cook i mean wow. and only you know if i'm a cook at a restaurant i just want to get my shit out right so like i'm done this is pretty good put it out i put out my broccolini part or whatever that's pretty good the sauce is not quite salty enough um the chicken's a little overdone and that place gets to the pass it looks good it looks fine i'm okay with it because i just want to do my next plate the guy who made the chicken maybe knows it's a little over but he needs to get it out there because he's oh, behind it's two different guys I'm saying doing it the could be a million different chicken. guys oh and the guy God. who's the guy who's monitoring the pass maybe he um or she um uh doesn't isn't going to taste every single piece of every bird that comes out because they're not going to fuck the dishes up and that goes out and then the person who heard that restaurant was amazing and it might be amazing when all those elements are done right but they chase it and they're like this is this is just okay i don't know why people are tweeting about this and then they go tweet and saying like i went to la granui last night and i didn't think it was that good and they were right but that's because there was nobody there who was like taste like you need another layer of person who's putting a fucking uh cake tester in the chicken getting the temp. Oh, you don't the thing is you don't even think about this you really. don't even like think about going it. to eat at a restaurant you're like oh i heard this place was good all right let's try this particular dish you don't think about three different people working on one plate or even more five different people working on a plate or even between the seasoning the chicken the broccoli it's a million whatever. different Damn, moving parts um, the produce uh, isn't yeah. that good that day the avocado like, isn't ripe enough no one the you know like a lot of these things are built on broths and stocks and like if the person at the beginning of the week made shit stocks shit broths and the chef took a couple of days off because uh you know he or she uh wanted to uh you know rehabilitate themselves they get there and the the, the mise en place which is the the shit that goes into the kitchen wasn't done well on monday there's not enough time for them to fix it they're just they're they're, they're playing tennis with a broken racket you know, and there's not, they maybe can fix it for Friday, but like there it's, it's like, it's a juggling act and this place still functions with, let's say two, if you're juggling two balls, but if you're not juggling three balls, it's not good. And, and, uh, yeah. And you need, so it, 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 it takes a lunatic to want to do it, to want to do it well. And that's why, that's why we're moving, I think into a lot more, into a lot more simple restaurants where they do one thing because one thing is much easier to execute um it's it's very hard to do a long list of a bunch of different things and it looks like from a person who eats at restaurants not obviously not in the kitchen that's a flex bro it, it looks like uh diners are dying but they are really the only people that will have what 50 things on a menu Oh, right. Well, the, the thing is that those things are fine and like the, the expectations for those things, you know, my eggs aren't done right. You send them back to get, they're fine, right? Like it's not, 
It's not that hard. Diner, yeah, you have a lot of things, but I'm saying like even a new American restaurant or a or a, or a Chinese restaurant or whatever, where there's where there's 15 things on the menu. You have 15 things on the menu. You still, I mean, it depends what you're making, but you probably have 40 or 50 things, maybe 80 things between sauces, different veg proteins that have to be done ahead of time and then cooked properly. So that's already a million different little steps. I shot documentaries about the most fancy restaurants in the world for many years. And, and, um, and the chefs would go through often would do a thing where they would taste every piece of every, of every dish and they'd have maybe 10 dishes or 12 dishes on their tasting menu, but they would go through and taste 500 different things sometimes before or not 500 but at least 200 between different garnishes and different little broths and stocks and before it went to the customer no before the service even started that day like i need all of like i need one of each plate done before service and i want to see the full tasting menu done at 5 30 before we have our break or at 4 30 and then i want to taste everything and then um and then I'm going to reseason that. And then during service, you know, you leave your broth, you stock on for too long. It, it, and then it, you lose a little bit too much of the water and then it becomes too intense and then it gets through, you know, it's just like, you're really, you really got to monitor everything. Stand up's great because you just have to, you have to be in a good mood and you have to, and you have to be funny and, you know, and you don't have to bring anything with you. That's awesome. I mean, you need to write new shit or whatever, but cooking takes to do it at a very high level. Like that's why sometimes I got a little sick of tasting menus because I saw all of them. So I kind of see the ways in which they're all similar, but they're not all similar. I saw a lot of them that were kind of starting to do the same thing, but I don't have a lot of time for people. I don't think anyone has to ever go to a tasting menu, but to just immediately dismiss very high level cooking as just shishi. And I have the huge advantage of I've tried a lot of these places, like the most, you know, the $500 dinners or whatever. And it's absurd that there are such things as $500 dinners, but nobody blinks at $500 Taylor Swift tickets. I mean, they blink. It's true. They blink and they should blink. And it's like, what the fuck are we doing? But like the amount of spinning plates that go into that $500 dinner when it's done, when it's done perfectly, like to me is on the level of the greatest ballets that have been presented. Um, so is it the hardest job? It is one that drives people to the greatest levels of insanity. That's what I would say. And ones and chefs that you meet that are kind of now chill, they probably suck now. You meet a chef who was huge and had a lot of amazing restaurants and now they're cool. They suck. Their restaurants now are just fine. They're coasting. I've never met someone who has an amazing restaurant who's not maniacal on some in some way. But, you know, Kokodak, which was at the U.S. Open, opened this year, one of the most successful openings ever in restaurant history in New York. All they do is fry. They do a lot of things, but they do fried chicken very well. And... And, and they, there is a push towards these restaurants, like figuring out, like, how else can we make this feel like a fine dining experience when we don't have to be razor, like, meticulous with the food? Like, we can make amazing food that's served in larger quantities and that's more sort of home style, and then we'll make the rest of it feel like fine dining, and then we can be more, um, more A, more efficient, but also more consistent. And that, that, that's a cool thing that's happening, I think, in restaurants. Anyway, yeah, I like telling dick jokes. I hate when vaginas are wide. <laughs> uh, but just to circle back on, I guess, the original question that made us get into this. In I order just to, saw that look on your face when I was ranting about restaurants. I don't think I've ever seen you interested before. In me, at least. I don't mean sexually. Go on. Well... So you, so I have been interested sexually as he checks his phone. Um, but I think that going back to the original question, I would think that, yeah, opening a restaurant would be one of the more insane businesses to start. It's insane. Yes. Um, 
because you can, with you very, can open up so many other uh, businesses that wouldn't have as many moving and parts. Might, theoretically. And might make money. That's the thing is restaurants yeah. don't even make money. Yeah. Like when, when I've told, cause I've looked at some restaurants. Cause also, sorry to, deals, to interrupt, please. but yeah, there, there has to be, your there's, show, baby. there's some insane number on how the percentage of uh, restaurants that are actually open I'm at the end of the 10 year lease in that, New York right. city. It's very slim, but that's because they get bored. Like, in a way, it's kind of like you wouldn't want to tell the same joke for 10 years. I, I, I don't, the, the numbers that scare people more are that you do this amazing, insane level of work. And then, you know, you make, if your restaurant's making, if your restaurant's making 6% profit a year, or not a year, but if, you're, if your profit is 6% of your revenue, people are like, oh, good job. You know, like. That's insane. Yeah. Because you can make that in real estate and not even wake up. Well, that's a tragic thing, right? Is some of these some of these people on TV selling houses? They do one house and they make more than a restaurant does, and or regular real estate agents who aren't on TV as well. But um, nothing, no shade to real estate. I think it's uh, real estate brokers. They really make the world go round. I'm sorry for dinging them. Um, probably the most important people in society, I would say, are real estate brokers. Um, but yeah, there's so many easier ways to make money. You're so crazy if you get into hospitality. Uh, but now they're starting to be rewarded with cool points. Like now chefs and restaurateurs are cool. And even billionaires, like you can't, you can't buy. It's one of the few things that you can't buy. You can't buy that level of, of art, right? Like you can buy art pieces, but you can't pay a billion dollars to make the greatest restaurant in the world because, as I've said, like, you can't really cheat it. You can't really just spend a bunch of money and then have a good restaurant. You kind of have to – people there have to really care about it. Oh, you second, could, but you too, lose money on it. they're too rich, they just – they're not going to be there for 80 hours. You, of course, lose money. Of course, you lose money, but they don't, they don't care. Like, a lot <laughs> – Whatever. But there have been a bunch of deals recently where hotels and, and, and fancy brands have just paid to put a good restaurant in their space. And they're never really good. They're never, like, good. They're always... The, the restaurateurs who open them are always excited because they're making real money for the first time. But those restaurants are never, like, good, good. They're always a little commercial. Everything's a little... Nothing's exciting. Um, yeah. But anyway, food's cool. People should... Uh, care more about it it's not just fine dining by the way every all food school i i mean i'm incapable of making food jokes on stage by the way I, i'm very envious of people who can go up and be like you know here's a funny thing about chicken wings because like i start thinking about chicken wings and i just have a million thoughts and uh, and i just i'm like well you know, my problem with chicken wings like the mat it's very unique to me I, I just can't i can't even i can't even broach the subject on stage i took a photo of you the first ever time you did an open mic. Do we um, have that photo? We must. Well, I don't think the people care, but we care. Well, then they probably do care. Let's pop it up. Hopefully we have it. It's going to, we, oh, we definitely, I, if you, if you don't delete text history, I definitely sent it to you at some point. Do you delete text history? I accidentally deleted anything more than a year old. Well, that was probably like four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. Probably five years ago, actually. Yeah, which I regret because there's well, some, it's okay, man. Well, now you're not about you. There's some funny text conversations that I've had with me, close sort of family people that I would like to write into scripts at some point, right. but I don't have okay. it anymore. Well, bro, um, I actually just recently checked your Instagram. You've had one clip that just went insanely <laughs> viral because some guy was being rude, and then uh, and then also your headlining. And that's, and that's when I got the call for this podcast. So <laughs> <of course>. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, your I headlining. Well. Um, uh, within a couple of weeks, right? Is that that's your first headlining gig? Very exciting. I did it a couple of weeks ago, actually, motherfucker. Um, uh, what what was it? September seventeenth or something? It wasn't it the dojo. The do <laughs> yeah. It was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I messed it up. No, How no, no. I was doing the. It was great. You know, I've done like some bar shows where you do the longer, but it was my first me on the poster thing, yeah, which I done. will say is um. There's so much of this fucking shit that's like, uh, you got to be shameless, you know, like you got to want to see yourself on a poster. I wasn't, it's not, I wasn't like, hooray, my, you know, my mom wants a copy of the poster. I wasn't excited about me on the poster, but, um, yeah, it's nice. I, the, the, the scary thing is that, you know, I've done a lot of like featuring, which is like the middle thing and you can suck ass because they're not paying to see you. 
even if they don't know who the fuck you are, they showed up to this club and I walked to the bathroom and people were like, oh, you're the person we're seeing. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, you know, and then their the quality of their evening is in my hands. Yeah, that's very true. So I always even think of that when I'm the last person who goes on a show, which is pretty rare. All right. Um, but like that the last taste in their mouth is is what I'm giving them. And I'm, and then even if I hate the show, I hate everything about it. I always try harder at the end because I do. I'm very conscious of I'm, I'm so insecure and so guilty that I'm, I'm very conscious of the experience that people are taking away. You don't strike me as an insecure guy. You strike me as a guy who wants to know everything that's going on in a certain situation, but you don't strike me as insecure. There's, maybe there's a, a thin line between um, obsessed with feedback, obsessed with how they're feeling about me and insecurity. I mean, you know, I can, I can, I'm, I'm at the point where I can have a bad set and not be insecure and decide that I'm bad at comedy. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not the most secure. I don't go around telling people I played UConn tennis. You know? <laughs> how, uh, how long were you into comedy when you first saw that or when we were first at that open mic? I had been doing it. I, I know that I'd been doing it. Um, Dude, the funniest I feedback you gave me at that open mic. Did by I, the way, you're like, you were holding the mic well, dude. I was like, all right, this guy, thanks. I appreciate well, you believed in yourself from day one. Did I? For sure. Bro, my face was broken on that stage. Do you remember that? I don't, I remember thinking that you believed in it. You struck me as the kind of person who's like a, a, a banker who was delusional who was going to do it once because you thought you were funnier than everyone else. So what do you mean I believed in myself? I just believe the opposite. No, 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 no. That's that would be someone who believed in themselves. Someone who was just like, Oh, I'm going to try this thing and then go back to JP Morgan. Um, but nice. That's, that's your real thing. I don't know if your listeners or your viewers are aware of, uh, of your, of your, you being a nice person. Do you think they are? I don't know. No, because people will say that to me sometimes like they're shocked that I'm nice. I think that they probably think that you're like, uh, like I always see you as someone who would be on VH1 or something, you know, being like the next clip coming at us from whatever. And that guy's always an asshole. And you're in, in no, you're not an asshole. Either way. So even at that first mic, um, I remember being in it. I'd done comedy long enough to be like, obviously, to be like, I'm going to tell him he held the mic well. What a fucking loser I was. Every time, I, I'll tell you something. I've never been happy that I've given someone advice. I've never given someone well, advice. Even, but the last time like, we were on a show together, though, you gave me a tag, which I, I appreciate. Tag, which yeah. I'm fine with. Yeah. Well, did you use it? Yeah, I've used it before. Does it work? It does solid, before, yeah. Before. Well, because when I, yeah, I mean, it Before depends how. You used how, it once. You tried it once and it No, it no, 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 no. I've used it a few times. I, mm -hmm. Dude, I'm pretty sure I used it uh, this past weekend. Pretty sure. Pull up the I set. I did. Pull up the set. Um, I'm just saying I've never. Do, do you give people advice now when you see when you see younger people? Sometimes, yeah. What do you say? I mean, things that they could fix quickly or like if you're wearing your hat on stage and you can't see your eyes, I'll tell them that. That's an easy, quick feedback. Or I feel comfortable enough where I've seen they're set enough. It'll be like, this would be funny to add. Okay. But yeah. usually I wait for somebody to ask me. Yeah, I don't know. I have this burning desire. I have this burning desire to assist and uh, I hate it. I hate it about myself. I like it. I, I, giving a tag is different than being like... You know, when you get on stage, I think the audience is thinking this. I hate when I've ever been sort of more philosophical. But if it's positive, why would you hate, why would you not like that? Just shut up. Just no, smile. Cool, man. Yeah. I disagree. Because man. I don't think It's always nice to get a po to get positive reinforcement. Positive is good. I like this thing that you did. I don't think it's helpful to be like your stature is giving this attitude to people that I don't think you intend to convey, but that's what's coming across. You're saying that in a positive and negative way. If, I'm saying if that's I don't what, how think you see that it. I that ever helps people. And also all advice that I've ever gotten in comedy, I have completely been like, oh, cool. Thanks for talking to me. I hope you get hit by a bus. And then two years later, I'll realize that thing myself. And that's the only way it ever seeps in. I don't, I don't really understand that. <laughs> I'm saying that I don't think that, I think you're only serving yourself by giving someone advice. I think that we need to come to things ourselves 
in or well maybe that's just me no well I, I i do think that's true because people don't realize until they're ready to realize but yeah. it would theoretically help if you push them along a little bit faster even things like your opening joke people are like you need a really strong opener and i'm like why and you don't and you don't realize until you're in maybe a couple of years you don't realize the value of having a strong opener to gain the trust of the audience yeah but I don't think that I ever really understood that until I kind of had enough bad ones where I had done that. And then I was like, oh, I mean, it's so stupid. It's like, I get why you need an opener, an opening joke. But I've, you know, everyone, every class, every book always says, move your best thing to the beginning and then something like that to the end. I mean, it's, it's corny as it sounds. It's also like the online clips, right? You got to start off super strong so people... <laughs> Look, Are don't interested. I know it? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you do know it. <laughs> don't I know it? I'm sure, dude. Anyway, bud, well, it's an honor to be here. Dude, I'm Thank very you happy you world. came, man. We've actually been trying to get you on this pod for like two and a half years. That's Anything what else? Want. You want to get you want to get dark or what? No. You want to talk about tennis? Do you like tennis? I went to the uh, U.S. Open finals. I Ooh. don't want to talk about tennis at all. Why? I don't think I have anything to add to the tennis. You didn't have fun? I found it too gentlemanly, to be honest. Were they ripping the ball and like fighting with the rackets or no? They were hitting it hard, like but yeah. the whole fan, everyone's very quiet. Well, first of all, I was there and I was fairly close to Taylor Swift and it was, and it was, I just found it kind of sad it, for two reasons that a, I found it pathetic that most of the stadium spent a lot of their time looking up at taylor really well that's yeah. what started to happen with football last year i wonder and if it was embarrassing for me because it was our first date um you went on a first date to the u.s open I finals joking with taylor swift there we go uh -huh. all right god for damn one, it you got one me on the podcast you got me no but and then and then it wasn't just that it was also i was embarrassed because i kept looking at her and travis kelsey was there and i kept being like Oh, look at look at how they're acting. They're happy now. Oh, are they fighting? Were what they on I... the big screen a lot? No, they weren't. No, no, that was interesting in the, that clearly they were not, um, you know, because the U.S. Open is very happy to be a star fuckery fucking mess of New York's well, high society. Well, but it looked like there were a lot more influential people at the U.S. Open this year, more so than I the years before. It's growing and growing and growing. It is probably the coolest single New York centric event. Yeah. I, that I doesn't exist elsewhere, right? Like, imagine if we had a... If the Masters was in Central Park, I think it would be a, a similar uh, a similar thing. But um, I think that Taylor had a deal. For, so all I'm trying to say is I believe that there are back... Chan there's, much, uh, there's a lot of back-channeling between the celebrities and the tournament. So I think Taylor said, I, you know, I will come, but I don't want to be... Don't put me on the, on the big screen. Because... Uh, a lot of the other celebrities that were there were being shown on mm. the big screen, but they didn't show Taylor. And Taylor, in terms of gravitas, out outsizes the rest. Every Elon Musk was there. Uh, he wasn't. Was he? Yeah. He was confirmed, right? Yeah. Um, everyone in my booth was like, "Is that, is that guy? Just was the, kind of looks kind of stocky." Um, you couldn't. We were on the other side, uh, but you know, they kept showing like Andrew Garfield, you know, no hate to Andrew Garfield, but look, you're in a room with Andrew Garfield and Taylor Swift. It's like, who's Andrew Garfield? You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, do you, uh, are you happy that the U S open, are you happy that every basic girl in Soho is wearing a U.S. Open hat now. Dude, oh my gosh. Does it gosh. give you foray to be like, I played tennis at UConn? You know, it takes a little bit for people to find that out. I don't open with that. I, that's as, your opener. As you're talking about openers. That's your opener. <laughs> well, it's either I'm vegan, I'm Have a you college seen the, tennis player. The, U, the YouTube compilation of Ted Jones talking about UConn? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I haven't made it yet. But, um, <laughs> um, I don't know. It'll get there. What do you think about that? What do you think about this sport? Because tennis wasn't cool five years ago, right? Or no. 10 years ago? No. It's what only you, really been cool since this past U.S. Open. No, 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 no. The U.S. Open hats, like, you need to open your eyes, young lad. The U.S. Open hat has been a fixture of basic chick for at least five years. I haven't seen that. This year, I've seen it in, undoubtedly. At definitely three years ago, it was already happening. Yeah. Last year, aggressively. Sure. This year, 
if if you know well i mean they have so many different colors is what i've really noticed like girls are wearing lime green u.s open hats i right. couldn't even believe that and well, then it was the the red hats and then i i've always noticed the u.s open 2024 but now it's like just the u.s open so they can wear these hats for years I don't know if they well, would. Well, they got to get a new one. Yeah, they're a great investment. But I'm saying- No, I'm talking about they can now wear it for next year like they had gone to the U.S. Let me, Open previously. Let me angle to get a little, yeah, little yeah, better please. look I want you. Let's you go, know. dog. No, no, no. But He's as someone comfy. that grew up playing tennis, um, relatively amazingly, mediocrely, if you, relatively to- Are you talking about- good you, at it. you did. No, 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 you. Um, that was like a J.J. Lieberman comment. You know that? He came on the pod and he was just shitting on me and I had to be like, bro, knock it off. So I'll let one or two go by, but go ahead. I'm just saying, is where does UConn rank? I mean, the bottom of the point? barrel division one. Yeah, that's what I mean. Right. Did you ever, did you ever, were you ever being like, did you ever think I might actually crack it? Yeah. How old were you when you realized you wouldn't crack it? 15. That sucks, right? Yeah. But, but, no, I, but I only were you fully, did you full, were you fully grown at 15? No, but I was homeschooled when I was 15 years old for tennis. Yeah, I just saw your mom leave. And, <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> implying that she was teaching me grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, 15 years old, I was homeschooled. And then I made the decision to go back to regular high school sophomore year. And that's kind of when you semi, that's like, at, the, at that point, you kind of give it up. I think three or four months into being homeschooled by like December, January, I was like, If you were 6'4", would it make numbers. a difference? Maybe, but not really. Because in tennis, you need to start when you're three or four years old to be top 100 in the and you, world, you realistically. Didn't? No. I started, I mean, I was playing tennis during, in the summer, and I was playing every sport. You had a moment where you were wiping people, and they were like, oh, you're not bad at this. Yeah, but that was in Long Island. And it wasn't on a scale where I was beating kids in Florida, Texas, and California. Because those are the main states where you need to go to Got be it. Got it. You know, serious. Okay, so you were never really, so you were like kid. I was always a good athlete. But you were like kid dream. I'm good at tennis. But you were never. Nobody was ever like, oh, he's gonna go far. Yeah, got it. Interesting, Interesting. jinx. Um, yeah, I was never good at, at anything. Um, I don't know what that's like at all. Uh, Where'd you? Do you grow up in Toronto? Toronto. Yeah. But wait, my question is, and then I'll, you can ask me all the questions you want about yes. my fascinating history. Um, what is it like for you to see? Because you know, you're you do comedy, but you're also uh, you're also you're also a functioning member of society. You know, you're out and about. I don't think that the U.S. Open hats have anything to do with tennis. I think that it's just, it's just girls doing, it's girls attaching to a trend in the same way that guys do with uh, Amy Leon. I don't, I don't uh, actually, I would love to say that tennis, maybe in the kind of more conservative backlash to previous, like, in the in the in this time period we're in now where you're allowed to brag a little bit about your wealth more than you were 10 years ago where yeah. it was so uncool to have money maybe like tennis being like a rich person thing is like more acceptable and then that is part of why the hats have taken off but I, I think it's just that you're just showing that you do shit in new york that's yeah. expensive i think it's also a social media trend too um taylor fritz's girlfriend you see like she's super big on the the platforms and she'll post a lot about tennis and mm. i think that yeah it brings in more eyes to the sport and people also wanting to be a part of it did you see that smoke show couple that was fucking dominating and then tommy pole vault twitter too. or pole vault tiktok that like hot the blonde model and her pole vault blonde yeah, I think, so. I think it's a couple. Yeah, I want to. I, I you took a pole, pole vault, vault now. <laughs> yeah, they, I'm gonna. I'm switching to homeschooling. Yeah, because I, right. uh, I'm taking. I did serious. see that. I did see that pole vaulter that like got his wang stuck that's, in the bar. Yeah, I guess no. that was on mine. Yeah, thing. that's your. That's your background. Yeah. <laughs> well, I went to performing arts school, so it's not far off. <laughs> yeah, that pole vaulting is the only sport they play there. Well, I meant with the you know oh, wang hanging Leotard. out. Leotard. Okay, got let's it. please go back to your. From Toronto. Yes. Your background growing up and then moving to New York. Yeah. Uh, bar Mitzvah at Holy Blossom. I'm um, just kidding. Is that a vegan restaurant? It's a vegan synagogue, <laughs> actually. <laughs> now you talking. I don't actually know where I was Bar Mitzvah. Really? I wasn't at a synagogue. It was a guy associated with a synagogue, but it wasn't at was a synagogue. That, it was his house? No, no, no. I didn't do one of those, one of those home birth Bar Mitzvahs. I was at a hotel, I believe, um, but it was a night ceremony. 
you know, it was more an inclusive bar mitzvah for all, for all, um, not inclusive for all races, but inclusive for, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, um, anyway, from Toronto, from Canada, big hockey guy, just kidding, never played, but told people I was a goalie for a bit, for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> Classic kid lie. Yeah. I, yeah. Maple uh, Leafs or no? Toronto Maple Leafs? I like the Leafs. Yeah, I like the Leafs a lot. Before I went to college, I was a huge, I followed the Leafs, followed the Jays, followed the Raps to a, Raptors to a less extent, lesser extent, but, uh, I liked sports, but I was like, I was like a sports Jew. You're, you're not, you're non-traditional sports Jew. You're one who actually plays. I was like, in many versions of my life, I would have been the, the chubby beardy Jew who wears Knicks jerseys and big sneakers and just watches every game and be like, the guy can't get a rebound, you know, which it, honestly, it, I've tried making jokes. Nobody knows what I'm talking about when I say that, but you, you know what I'm it's talking about. It's very niche. About. Yeah. Yeah. Very niche. Thanks. Fucking giving advice over here. Um, <laughs> well, you said it yourself. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Where'd you go to college? Niche. I went to a uh, college called Wheaton College. In Massachusetts? Yeah. Good D3. Yeah. Good D3. Solid D3. Good, D, good D3. Right. Yeah. Good, very strong D3 baseball team. Oh, yeah? So they say. Um, Wait, they've had I a couple think... people drafted. Do you know Peter Moran? I do. He went there. I don't think so. Maybe he did. Maybe I've talked to him about that. Maybe he went to the Christian one. No, no, he's quite Christian. Did so he go to the Illinois one or no, the no, Massachusetts? That's, that's one of the greatest stories ever. So it's, there's two, um, there's two Wheatons. Do you know this? There's yes, two Wheatons. One, in Illinois. one of them is in Illinois, and, and that guy Peter Moran was a super Christian at one point. So I bet he went to the Illinois one. I think you're right, actually. Um, one of the best stories about that is Andrea Chen, I believe, who was a news anchor, came to give the commencement address at my Wheaton and started naming you, you know, such a prestigious school with alumni such as, and was named no. from the other Wheaton, which is the only real exciting thing that happened. That's so funny for me. And then I knew I wanted to be a comedian. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, good school, you know, like rural, rural Massachusetts. Um, Nothing really to report there. Not a lot of Jews. Did you move to New York right after that? I did. Yeah. Moved to New York right after that. Kind of bummed around. Did some odd jobs. Went to cooked for a while. Went to grad school. So you did you want to go to culinary school? I did go to culinary school. No way. Yeah. I did go to culinary school. Yeah. What school? It's no longer exists, which is a cool. I didn't realize until this moment. That's a cool thing to say. They went to culinary people, school? Yeah, but... You should open with that. Well, <laughs> I don't know. You do the editing, not me. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people have said in my life, you know, like, oh, I went to this place that no longer exists. I've never said that before. Well, Yukon Tennis doesn't exist anymore. Does it not? No. What do you mean? You shut it down? Shut, shut down. No, I mean... <laughs> Uh, during COVID, as you can imagine, tennis teams don't really bring in be that amazing much. If you got canceled, that's what you got canceled for. for yeah, right. That'd be great. Um, uh, but UConn tennis uh, during COVID, that's when it got shut down. The, the programs they were, I think they were like two or three programs, and then also Title Nine. For those of you who don't know what Title Nine is, it, which I hope is literally everyone for, <laughs> since like 1975. Yeah, you check women your fucking shoulder muscle there. No, I didn't. I have like little bumps on my skin. I was probably weird from not eating meat. You think? Can you imagine? Yeah. So, yeah, none of B12. So, it's Title IX, 1979, they made for, like, the next 40 years that women would have equal scholarships to men for, like, the past 100 years. So, until, I think, for the next 15 or 20 years, or it might be for forever, women have uh, more scholarships than men. So, they have, like, a whole, they had a rowing team at UConn that was fully scholarship and people would walk on but the UConn tennis team didn't have any scholarships and we would just pretty much cost the school money so they cut the program um over well, COVID, I, I don't like understand three how they were trying to balance scholarships for men and women yeah why didn't they just do women's tennis they did do women's tennis they have women's tennis got and it. it has scholarships they still? yes oh got it got so it, they got still it. have women's tennis but we would just basically any tennis program unless you're top 10 in and the because country, they don't you're not do really bringing in money football they need to balance it in other places and basketball and especially basketball. at uconn because uconn basketball basically everyone's on scholarship football almost everyone then maybe they have one or two but wouldn't for there be, golf there's women's uconn football right or basketball yes 
and they're not scholarships. But no, no, they are. But the football team takes up so many scholarships, and then the basketball too. So they need um, to balance and then there's it an elsewhere. overcompensation. Yes, they need to balance Interesting. it. Interesting. Yes. Title nine, eh? Yes. So didn't, this is uh, huge at uh, Division One schools. That's basically why the women Court rowing just canceled Title Nine. I don't believe so. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, if they <laughs> what was that a bit or was that <laughs> did you know that <laughs> it was a bit that didn't really work? Yeah, well, I didn't. They, uh, I was confused. But if they did cancel Title Nine, you've yeah. gone tennis back up and running. That'd be fresh. I don't know. That'd be fresh. I wow. would want to donate. For I, I would want to donate a bubble, even though they didn't treat me the best. But I didn't treat them the best. But I was smoking weed all the time. Really? Yes. We, and you were mid-level good on the team? Yeah, I was mid-level on the team. That's sick. But I only played for two and a half years. And then I started taking acting, drama classes, but I was smoking too much pot. That's why I got in trouble. Um. Yeah, so you want to ban Title IX, ban pot? That's it. Those are your Maybe platforms? Maybe. <laughs> no, I don't want to do either of those things. We can, you can start it now, but he, he talked about a... Don't a, say it now, because then I just cut it. it. No, 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 don't say it, because you already said the thing before. We had to, what were we talking about before this? I don't even know. The podcast will never be the same. <laughs> I just wanted you to know. You went, oh, they canceled tennis, you were saying, which uh, was relevant. Um, and then I do, I, yeah, so I smoked weed for, I oh, I haven't smoked weed in seven months is what I was going to say. It sounded like that's what you said was you were going to bleep out. No. Then well, I'll go back to the part where I said I was going to cut it out. Got it, got it. I haven't but, smoked weed in seven months. Right. Anyway, yeah. uh, the point is, is that. What? Go ahead. Is that is that I went to uh, Wheaton? Yeah. Um, they fucked up the commencement. Andrea Chen, we don't never forget. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then I went to culinary school. Oh, um, and then oh right, that that's how you derailed me because you said they canceled the UConn tennis program. Um, see, I used to do this. I was a pod a big pod guy. Uh, I did a podcast about food for five years. Um, very successful. Uh, no merch though. But um, you have food jokes? You do. You got vegan jokes. Yeah, we were talking about that cashew bit that you that you so generously cashew. gave me a tag. Uh, of course. Um, calling. Who's calling? My mother. Well, uh, I think this is actually a perfect place for... You could pick that up if you want. I'm not picking it up. Okay, Dan. Uh, do you I'm like Daniel now. or Dan? Because um, we were talking about that in the beginning before you got here. You and who? Them. <laughs> the tennis balls? <laughs> uh, no, we gave um we gave a little cold opening. We yes, um, bro. We do. I like Dan. I like I I I I'm more. Uh, I think that Daniel uh, linguistically is a uh, is a superior name. Yeah, it is actually. Dan, I it's find more Brooklyn drug dealer. Sure. Okay. Which uh, one do you like, bro? I'm. How should I, I call you? When people call me Daniel, I think it's bizarre. Yeah. I'm. I'm much more comfortable in the world of Dan, but I. I, I, phonetically, I don't love Dan. What should I call you, bro? Dude, I feel like I answered the question. Just need a replay. <laughs> I don't think you did. Dan Janine, my man. Hey, there you go. This so is, you got it right. This was really fun, man. You got it and right. um, I hope that you all listening and watching enjoyed as much as I did. But anytime you think about food in a restaurant, you definitely don't think about, I'd say, a quarter of anything that you just said and spewed out. So thank you so much for the information. It's uh, helpful for me. You know, I'm yeah. trying to rethink about these things because I want to figure out how to move back into that world and, and make things that matter in that world. So, you know, a little bit of helping me kind of talk about it and refining what my actual positions are is not is not is, is helpful. Good. Good shit. Yeah. Uh, before we get out of here, man, uh, we're going to pop up your Instagram right here. Do you have anything to plug? This will be out uh, this coming Thursday. Please no. let us know. If you see me on a lineup at a comedy club, don't come. Uh, we got to get you. <laughs> we got to get you back on Margarita Monday within the next few weeks, please. That'd be that'd be terrific. Absolutely. All right. Dan, you're the man, dude. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time. Peace. Give me my